Our scripture passage this morning is found uh, in the book of Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be reading that starting at verse 16. Um, we're continuing in our series um, in the book of Colossians. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one defraud you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking a stand in visions he has seen, inflated without cause by the flesh and mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being held, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is it, why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees such as, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. And may God add the blessing uh, to the reading of his word. On any given Sunday morning, you can find on... Um, religious channels, uh, a minister or a preacher or a pastor or a, a ministry leader giving a message and watching and viewing a service um, on, on the TV. Matter of fact, our, you can even get them online. Our service you can get is now being on, online and live. And so, with the advent of me television, and then social media, and then media, and the way it's going is that you can probably get a service, or you can get a message, or you can see a preacher or a minister almost any time you want. And live, if you really, if you can't make it out to the service. So there's so much out there. But the reality is, if you look at it, and you examine carefully, of what you're seeing and what you're watching and what you're hearing is not everything is what they say is true just because they look the part I'll give you an example just because a person looks the part doesn't mean they are what they actually are and that's and we need to keep that in mind just because a person can look like a person and act and talk like one doesn't mean that he is one or that he does speak the truth. And I, through my years, I've seen that. And I've seen where many pastors and many ministers and so-called ministers of God and men of God and women of God have shared the word and some of it wasn't true. And I didn't always know and I wasn't always discerning enough. Discerning means to be able to figure out whether this is true or whether this is not true. And I wasn't discerning enough sometimes to know what was the truth and what was a lie. And so that's really, and that's what we have to, as you, as God's people, as we're going to get into this message, have to be able to figure out. Be discerning enough to be able to hear someone, look at what they, hear what they're saying, not just hear what they're saying, hear the words that they're saying, but really hear what's saying, what's behind those words and their actions. And I'm sure some of us have been in those situations where we've heard that, where we've heard ministers, we've heard people speak, we've heard people give their messages and give their explanations of things. But the reality is not what everyone says is true. Thank God, you know, and again, I keep going back to Billy Graham, but he always stuck to, he always spoke the truth. He gave a pure, simple gospel message. And you know that when he spoke, you were going to get the truth. You knew that. 
He knew that. So the Apostle Paul, as we've been talking about this morning, Apostle Paul is going to be talking about the uh, what is how to recognize the false teachers, the false truths that are out there. And he gives an explicit detail for them in their church. He was showing them what to look for, what to examine. Now, not every, in their specific, Paul is being specific to their situation. But not every situation is the same. And people, and, and people may come in and try and, 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 and stretch the truth. Try and embellish the truth. And Paul was trying to expose that to the church here. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And so we're going to get a glimpse of what was going on in that church. But the point is, is that what Paul is trying to do is trying to make the people aware of what's going on and what to look for. And then this is what we are, and how we're going to need to do is, how are we going to be able to know and be aware of what to look for if someone's not telling the truth? If not, someone's not speaking the truth. I'm going to just give you one real, real, one real quick example. Um, it, the scripture says that the enemy appears as an angel of light. And who's the enemy? The enemy is the devil, Lucifer, the liar. And he'll appear as, a, as someone, as an angel of light. In other words, someone who appears to be someone that he's not. But he never tells the truth. And so he can use individuals to stretch and distort the truth. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I want you to put your thinking caps on, your, hear, your hear, hearing ears on, and so that we can hear and really understand what's trying to be said here this morning. So we're going to be looking at three specific points. Uh, number one is, is that a mere shadow. Number two is that let no one. And then three, if you have died with Christ. A mere shadow. Let no one, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. This idea to, re, to act as your judge means that because you are complete in Christ, God has dispensed all with subordinate means of essential acceptance with Him. Someone will judge you based on what you do. In other words, well, you don't do this. You don't do this. You don't do what I do. You don't do this. You don't do this. And so therefore, you are lesser of a believer. You are lesser of a Christian. You are lesser of a, of a person because you're not doing what I say is right. Not necessarily according to what the Bible says is right, but what according to what I say is right. And so, what they're saying, and what, and what Paul is saying here is, is that let no one be, when it says let no one be your judge in regard to these things, it's not let no one be your judge because who is ultimately your judge? Jesus. And who are we accepted in? Who, who do we find our acceptance in? Who is our salvation? Where does our salvation come from? Who are we standing before God who makes us, who makes us righteous? In other words, who makes us right before God? Jesus does. So who is our judge? God is. Not people. Not self, as we're going to find out, not man and his self-made standards. Self-made standards, quote, that he judges saying, well, if you're not doing this, then you're not really a strong, you're not really a Christian, or you're not really saved, you're not really doing that. And people, and, and what ends up happening, folks, is that people fall under condemnation. They fall under condemnation because our salvation doesn't come based on the judgment of man. Our salvation comes based on the fact that Christ has called us, Christ has saved us, and Christ is going to take us home. Not on what man says. So don't let someone judge you based on what 
they are their standards. But on the standard of what? The Word of God, and what the Word of God says, and what Jesus says. Because you're saved because of Jesus. Not because of what man says, but because of what Jesus says, and what His Word says. Amen? And to food or drink in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. It says, in other words, pay no regard to anyone who sits in judgment on you as to legal observances and respect to foods or any other observances. Well, you're not really keeping the Sabbath. There was a thing there some years ago. I know it's important. And I know it's, it's, really, it's really critically important. I know it's really critically important to keep the Sabbath. But there used to be a thing that if you did anything on the Sabbath, and we did this as Christians, I remember this, is that if you did anything on a, on a, on a Sunday, the Jews, for the Jews it was the Sabbath, it was a Saturday, but for Christians it was a Sunday. If you did anything on a Sunday, then you were a bad Christian, and that you weren't really close to God. And I believe me, I grew up in circles where that was the case. And people will look down on you and judge you. Other Christians would. Because you did stuff on a Sunday. But that was this very same thing that Jesus talked about, where the Pharisees were being hypocritical because they were trying to heal, because Jesus was trying to heal somebody on the Sabbath. Or Jesus was spending time with somebody on the Sabbath, doing something with them and, and doing something good with them. And then they, and, the, and the religious leaders were trying to judge them. Or the religious leaders, they were trying to eat something and um, that maybe they didn't agree with, which was on, wasn't according to the law. And then we, and then we, maybe somebody's eating something, and we don't agree with it. That's not, <clears throat> how can you be a Christian and call yourself and do that? And we put and we and we and we and what we do is we put labels on things, whether it's food or whether it's the Sabbath or whether it's a certain actions, whether a dress is too long that goes eight, a certain amount of inches below the knee. I mean, I mean, people judge other Christians and say they're not really Christians or living for the Lord. I'm not saying I, you have to dress modestly. I'm not, I'm not, that's not the point. The point is, is that it got to be so ridiculous that it wasn't a certain amount of inches below, you know, below the knee, then you, you weren't really, really being a strong, holy Christian. And then what ends up happening? People end up getting condemned. They do. They end up getting condemned because they're not following man's rituals or man's judgments or man's standards. Rather than, I'm all for modesty, I really am. But not according to man's standards, but according to God's standards. And we do that. And we've, I've seen that in the church, folks. But, and then what ends up happening is that people get judged because they're not doing what their standard says they should be doing. And then what ends up happening? People end up getting what? Condemned. People end up getting condemned. And, they, and, they, and when there's no condemnation, for what does the scripture say? For now there is no condemnation for who? For those who are in who? Christ Jesus. Not that you can go out and do anything you want to. I'm not saying that. But you, you live according to the standard of what? The word of God. Not according to man's standard. And that's the point here. And that what these, relig what these people in this church were doing was is saying, because... And they were throwing people off, and people were believing, and people were saying, I don't know. I mean, what's going on here? And they, and they looked really religious by their self-made rules, like just like the Pharisees, their self-made rules and their traditions. And people were, some of the people were believing that, some weak, younger Believers were believing that and they're falling under condemnation and fear. And it was creating division within the church. And that's why I'm saying that we need to have, we need to know what? We need to know the Word of God, don't we? 
We need to know what the Word of God is saying so that we know what the truth is, what God's truth is, and what man's lies are, or man's distortions are, I should say that, or man's traditions, or man's laws. And that's why we need to have discernment. Because there's a lot of books out there, there's a lot of magazine articles out there, there's a lot of teaching out there on the radio and on the television, and not everybody, and a lot of people have their, and a lot of people will speak about things that are not, what, from here, and what ends up happening, that Christians and believers end up becoming condemned as a result. And it throws them off in their walk and their relationship with God. It throws them in a tailspin. I've seen people, folks, because they fell under condemnation because of man's laws, that it creates division within the church, and the church is a split. I've seen that, folks. Because of man's traditions and man's ways, rather than the Word of God. I've seen it happen. I've been a part. I've been saved almost 40 years. I've seen it happen, folks. Because of man's traditions. And that's why we have to have the sermon enough to say, no, this is not from God. This is man's thing. And I'm saved because of what? By the blood of Jesus. For by, what this verse says, for by grace you are saved, not by man's keeping of man's traditions and man's laws. And what man says, it's by grace, folks. Grace. And grace alone. And we need to have, receive that. We need to walk in that. And that's where real freedom comes from, folks. Real freedom comes from following, what? The Word of God. And doing what it says. And, when you, and you have freedom there saying, yeah, I'm doing my best to follow God's Word because uh, I love Jesus. If you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments. That's in John. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So his commandments are where? Where are they found? In here. Not man's traditions, not man's ways, but in here, in the Word of God. And if you really love the Lord, you're going to follow what it says, and then there's no condemnation there. Because what does God do? God shows you mercy, doesn't He? So, okay, son, I know your heart's right, your heart's in the right direction. You messed up a little bit, it's okay. Let's get back on track. But there's no condemnation there because condemnation comes from who? Comes from the enemy. And God will use, and the enemy will use people to bring condemnation on us, won't he? And remember, and this is a verse you should not forget, it's in Romans 8. For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, folks. Because the condemnation was paid for where? At the cross. That's where it's paid for. Let's go look at verse 17. The things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So the blessings, um, but so you look at those things. It says, do not eat, do not touch. They're all temporary, folks. All temporary. It's going to perish. And when he's saying it, they're all going to perish. But the real substance is what? Is who? Is Jesus. Not what man says. Not what a gifted orator or preacher or um, a speaker has with large, maybe a large church or whatever. But what the scripture says. This is what the truth is. The substance is what? In Jesus. Not in tradition. Not in the law. Not in a ritual. It's not in a tradition. Folks get all bent out of shape. Folks will get all bent out of shape if you do not follow their tradition of the church. They will. I'm telling you folks. Folks will get all bent out of shape. They will. If you don't follow the tradition of the church, it's like you can lose your salvation. If you don't do stuff a certain way. If that, but that's not the way Jesus said it is, folks. It's not. 
Do what the scripture says, not what man says. Because the substance is what? The substance is who? Is in Christ. Look at verse 17. Let's look at verses 18 and 19. This is so critically important. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. In other words, this idea that no one keep defrauding you means, of the prize means, no one, let no one act as your judge. I've seen in certain cultures and certain traditions where people during this time of the year, during the, Lent, the Lenten season, will, like, um, in certain countries, will get their cross, and they'll, and they'll go, and they'll go up these stone steps, like they're going up Golgotha, up the hill Golgotha with the cross on their back, until their knees are bleeding. And they think that that's holy, they think that that's something that God's going to be well pleased with. It's ridiculous. But some folks think that that's a godly way of doing things. Self-abasement. In other words, making yourself look to be holy so that others can see you and look at you. That's what, ha that's what it is. Making you look, I'm holy, look what I'm doing. I'm lashing myself. Or I'm, you know, or I'm, I'm fasting. Look at me, I'm fasting for 40 days. Look how skinny I am. Self-abasement for the purpose of of letting others see you for who you are. And, th and appear that, well, look how holy I am because I'm fasting. Well, look what I'm doing because I'm doing this. Or look what I'm doing and I'm basing myself and making yourself like a voluntary humility. In other words, you're not, hum it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord so that He will lift you up. And what they're doing is they're humbling themselves so that man can see them rather than God see them. You're walking in humility, not so that man can pat you on the back and say, wow, you're just so holy, you're so righteous, I wish I could be where you are. And that's what they want. And they think that that's an air, and that's an air of spirituality that has no substance to it. It's not real. You know a real humble man when you see it. doesn't take credit for, a real humble person doesn't take credit for what they've done, for what they've accomplished. Again, I keep going back to Billy Graham, but he's just such a great example, as a recent example. He was a, he was a real man of humility. Never took any credit, never did anything you know, that would bring glory from him, glory to him, and take it away from Jesus. That wasn't his, that's just not the way he operated. That's just not the way he walked. But false prophets will always look to bring what? False teachers will always look to do what? Have a false sense of humility. And look to bring and do, do what? And bring what? The attention to who? Themselves. Rather than to Christ. And that's what you need to be aware of. Number one, a, a, a false sense that they... Um, their own law, you need to be aware it's, it's, it's their tradition, their way of things, they're doing things that are not according to the Word of God. And number two is a sense, a false sense of uh, humility, like they're so humble and they're so righteous and they're so holy. You know what Paul called himself? He called himself the chief of sinners. Here is probably the, the most, the, probably the the, probably the, the, the most well-known righteous man that we have that walked this day that was beaten I don't know how many times for the Lord. And he says, I'm the chief of sinners. He didn't say, look at me, look, out, look how many times I've been beaten. Look how many times, look what I suffered for the Lord. Aren't I a great apostle? Aren't I holy? He didn't do that. 
Did you see Jesus do that? Absolutely not. Jesus humbled himself because he wanted to bring glory to his Father. And so religious leaders and people who speak the truth that's not false will have a false sense of humility. And you, and you need to be able to discern that. You need to be able to discern that. You need to be able to discern that. Because not everybody on television or on the radio or what you read is telling the truth. Part of the thing is, it's, it's their law, it's their way of doing things. And there's a, a sense of holy, I'm so humble. I want you to see that. And you need to be aware of that, folks. You need to be aware. You need to have discerning eyes, in other words, being able to tell the difference. Just like, a, like one of our sisters here used to work in a bank, be able to tell a phony bill when it comes through. Because how do you tell a phony bill when it comes through? You, you work with the real one all the time. And when, the, when the phony one comes through, you would be able to discern. Because you've been spending time with the, the real stuff. And what's the real stuff with us? The Word of God. You're spending time with the Word of God, so you know these pages. And you flip through these pages, and you're flipping through these pages, and you know it because you've been, you've been in it. And then someone, and then a truth, and then someone tries to slip in a, a, a false thing in there, and all of a sudden, what's this? What's this? Because you handled the truth so much that when false comes in, you immediately, your sensitivities, your spiritual sensitivities, oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? You're aware of what's false when it comes through. But the challenge is that if you haven't been spending time in here, and now I'm talking daily, folks. Daily. Daily. You haven't been spending time studying the Word, and in the Word, and reading the Word. Then when the false comes, the traditions of men come, the false humility comes, you're not going to be able to discern it. One of God's charge to me is, and he, he, as He's spoken to me, is, is that He wants us as His people to grow in our faith and to be mature and to really know Jesus and to really know truth and to be able to grow and be mature because that's how this church will grow. That's how this body will grow. As if we know, not just knowledge up here, but knowledge down here, in the heart, where it really counts. You can have all, the devil knows the word of God, word backwards and sideways, but he doesn't have it down here. And that's what, and that's part of what God's purpose is. Because as the church grows, we're going to need to grow too, so that we can receive all whom God sends to us. Amen? Okay. Um, it says let, in verse 18 um, and let no one defraud you of your prize in other words stop letting people defraud you of your the grace that God has given you in your life because that's what they're trying to do and, to, and, and, and taking it you know because what he wants to do is is that he wants to, to take from you the acceptance that you have in Christ. We are accepted in what? And as the scripture says, we are accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? Jesus. And what the false teachers will try and do is, is they'll try and take that acceptance that we're accepted. No longer condemned, but we're accepted in the beloved. In other words, in Christ. And they'll try and take that from you and put that, and, put, and, and they put themselves in the place of God. And, 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 and condemn you and have them follow you, and follow them, rather than following Christ. And that's where cults start from, folks, because it, it, it's a charismatic leader, isn't it? 
Look at Jim Jones, charismatic leader. He said, nobody, that that can never happen to me. B believe me, trust me. People who were there were business people and regular people. And he knows called regular people, folks. They're not, they weren't weak-minded necessarily people. Regular people who didn't know the truth, they got sucked in following a person rather than for following a ministry, rather than following Christ. And their whole purpose is to get you to not follow Christ, but to follow them. And in and, and, and verse 19, and not holding fast, um, not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. In other words, um, and not holding fast. In other words, the idea to cling to. You ever, I, I cling, I, I use this phrase, but I'm using it in a, in a strong way. People like, people like say, say the trees. And what do they call them? They call them tree huggers. And so what is the tree hugger trying to do? He's trying to hold on to the tree to do what? So that the so that the, the loggers don't come in and chop it down so that we can have paper and whatever and, and build houses or whatever. They're called tree huggers. But the idea, I'm using that word and that phrase here to describe, it says, um, not, and not holding fast to the head from which the whole body. So what these, believe, what these teachers will do is they're trying to teach you not to hold fast to whom? To Jesus. Not to hug Jesus. Right? So they're, what they're trying to teach you is follow me. You don't need to follow Christ. They may not say it out, outwardly, but they're, they're applying it. And what do we need to be doing all the time? We need to be hugging who? Jesus. Hanging on to Jesus. When the waters and the rage and the, come when the storms come, and the waves come, and they're coming, who are we holding on to? Jesus. But these false teachers, they're gone. They're gone. When the storms come, and when the, and the, and the war is coming, and everything's coming, they're gone. You have nothing to hold on to, do you? But Jesus will always be here, right? Absolutely. I'll never leave you what, nor forsake you. Never. Never, ever, ever, ever. And we need to continue to hold on to who? To Jesus. Be a, be a Jesus hugger. Hang on to him. Hang on to Jesus with your dear life. Cling to him as, as, as much as you can. And to the head from the whom the whole body it being supplied and held together by joints. And, it, it, and the idea there is, in verse 19, is that everybody, it's the whole body. And everybody working together. Everybody clinging to Jesus. And everybody loving each other. And this is the, as I was studying this, everybody's loving each other. And all the joints are held together. The bones and the joints and the, and the, and the sinews and the muscles. And everything are all held together. And that's the body of Christ. Everybody loving each other and encouraging other, each other and building up each other. Hang on to Jesus. Hang on to Jesus. Hang on to Jesus. Everybody encourage. Remember I talked about this last week. Everybody encouraging one another. Come on, we can do this together. I need your help. Let's do it together. Come on. We need each other, don't we, folks? I talked about this last week. We need each other. We build up each other. Encourage each other. And let us encourage one another all the more as we, what? as we see the day approaching. Encouraging each other to continue on. And to hang on to Jesus. And to follow Jesus. And not listen to that garbage out there. There's a lot of garbage out there. And sometimes we don't always have a discerning ear. So we may need another brother or sister to say, maybe that's not right. Maybe that's not the truth. And here, let's, let's, let's do this together. That's why we do Bible studies. That's why we, we get together. That's why we hear the Word of God. 
But we need to hear from each other too. And we need to encourage one another in that way. Well, let's go on here. We're going to finish up here. Verses 20 through 23. It says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is it if you are living in the world do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch? If you've died with Christ, in other words, if you've died, in other words, we've died with Christ and we've risen with Christ, in a figurative sense. In other words, we've died to the things of the world. Those things no longer have a hold on us anymore. And now we're alive to Christ. Know that Christ is living in our life. So, if Christ is living in us, if we've died to the things that are in the world, do not touch, do not taste, do the traditions and the rituals and all that stuff, if we die to that, and now we're living to Christ, and we're living in His grace, why do we submit ourselves to that again? Why? That's what, that's what Paul is saying here. Why would you subject yourself to that again? And bring yourself under condemnation. Bring yourself under condemnation, rather than subjecting yourself to Christ where there's grace. And there's, and there's life, and there's encouragement, and there's hope, and there's, um, and there's strength that can be found in Him. Let's go on here. It says, which all refer to things, verse 21, um, 22, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. And it's the commandments, and that's the bottom line. They're all destined to perish. According to what? According to the commandments and teachings of who? Of men. Not of God, not of the Word of God, not of Scripture, but of men. Why do we keep subjecting ourselves to that? These are, verse 23, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. In other words, it doesn't help you to live righteously. It doesn't help you to do the things that God calls us to do. And to live for Him. Just because you fast 40 days doesn't make you, it's going to bring you any closer to Jesus if it's not coupled with Jesus, see my heart. See my heart, Jesus. For all these things that man sets up, just because you do those things doesn't make you any more righteous or any more holy in the eyes of God. They have the appearance of being religious, but they're not religious, folks. They're not. And we have to be aware, we have to understand that, I've, and I've fallen into this trap too, folks, I believe folks that told me, you have to do this, this, and this in order to be right and religious with God. And I fell on a condemnation, folks, I did. I threw me in a tailspin. I did. I did. But thank God, you know, by His grace, I was able to see. I was able to see the light. I was able to come out of it and know the truth and see the truth and see and, and depend on the truth and find the truth. And this is what and this is what I'll conclude with, folks. We just have to be. Just because someone can speak well. <coughs> Just because my mom, and I remember this point, and it was a good, a good, good, really good illustration. I remember this is when my mom was alive, and God bless her soul. I remember when there was an election. This was probably back in 2008, or maybe 2004, or 2007 or 2003. And there's certain people that were running for election. And my mom said, my mom came from that era where, you know, looks and appearances were really important, and it is today. It says, he looks presidential. In other words, I'm just saying that, that that's, he had the look of what? Someone who would be a president. Tall, handsome, could speak well, carry himself well, had the looks. Had the looks. Spoke things, said things, 
was be able to capture you with his charisma, with his speech that was flowing like what? The folks fall for that. And, and we need to be aware of that, folks. Just because someone looks the part, or speaks the part, doesn't mean they are the part. Because sometimes they're out for their own, just because they look humble. And they look, or they, or they humble themselves in such a way where they, they bring themselves down and makes it appear like they're, they are humility. Just because they have that appear doesn't mean that they are. And I just want to encourage you that we need to be discerning. Discerning means knowing to have an eye to be able to, to see the truth. Have an ear. Have a sense. Something's not right here. Be able to have the discernment in our fingertips to be able to tell the phony from the counterfeit from the real. And that comes, folks, um, and we need to be able to encourage one another because sometimes we don't always get it. And be able to help others, guide others into the truth. And that's why we need the body. And we need to stay in His Word. We need to stay in prayer. Because that's how we know what the truth is. Because the devil comes to steal, kill, and what? And destroy. And that's what he wants to do. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking what? Someone to devour. And he uses people to devour other people. And we need to be on our and we need to be discerning. And we need to know the truth. Folks, read it every day. Study it every day. Get in it every day. I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in here just to prepare the message. I'm in here for my own personal growth as well. I need it. And we need, we need to do the same as well, folks. Because it's a battle out there. And the enemy wants to take the, the church out. He wants to take each one of us out. And he wants to take... And what he'll do is, is that uh, he'll look and he'll try and take the weak ones out first. I was watching a, a video, and I'll, I'll just end with this. But the end, and this is how the enemy works, and we need to be aware that the end where these hyenas were stalking this mother um, rhino and her baby rhino. These hyenas are, I hate hyenas. They're just relentless. They're nasty, ugly, sinister creatures. They really are. And they're vicious. And they were, and they were stalking, trying to wear this mom and the little one down because they're trying to get the little one. And there was a bunch of them. And the mom was able to be wise enough to be able to protect her child, to protect her, her child. And they were able to get away. But the reality is that's what the enemy does. The enemy seeks to find the weak ones or the little ones. And tries to he'll come in there with his with his other demons and he'll come in. They'll try and take the little one out. And try and take them out. And that's where we need each other, folks. We need to protect each other. We need to build up each other. We need to strengthen one another. And be like the mom as well. The mom who knew what to do. The mom was wise. And be able to get her child and bring her child to safety. So, I just want to encourage you, folks. It's a war out there. And the, and the enemy is really seeking to take us out, but we need to be discerning and wise enough to be able to know and be able to encourage one another to be able to stand firm and keep going. Amen.